All summer, our sermons have been coming from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. Today's the last day that we'll be hearing from Deuteronomy. We hear from Deuteronomy chapter 26. The Lord your God commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws. Carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him, that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, that you will listen to him. And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor high above all the nations he has made, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. This is God's word. Dear friends in Jesus, this is the 12th sermon that we've had from the book of Deuteronomy. It's got to be some kind of a record or something. Deuteronomy is not a book of the Bible that we usually think a lot about. And yet I hope that if you've been coming this summer to hear these sermons on Deuteronomy, I hope you realize that every single part of God's word is important. Every single little bit. In Deuteronomy, we've heard a bunch of the commands that God gave to his people, the Israelites, long ago. Again, if you've been coming, try to think back. Can you remember some of the different commands we've heard God tell his people? Heard about not worshiping false gods. About stoning people to death. About bringing first fruit offerings to the Lord. About choosing humble kings as leaders, about husbands not divorcing their wives, about showing compassion to foreigners and widows and the fatherless, about not using dishonest weights and scales and business transactions and I've heard about a whole bunch more too. And we've talked about how not all of these laws apply to Christians today. Some of God's commands were just for his people in the Old Testament, but it's good for us to hear and learn everything that God says. And today, what we have are are Moses' concluding words. He's ending up his sermon, the last thing he says to the Israelites. Before we get to Moses' words, though, we need to remember something. Why were those Israelites long ago God's special people in the first place? Do you remember? Was it because the Israelites were just a race of people that was better than everybody else? Of course not. There's no group of people like that. Was it because the Israelites were just such good people? No, there's no people like that either. Why did God choose the Israelites to be his special people? By grace. It was all by God's grace. When Adam and Eve sinned, God promised that he would send a Savior. A thousand years later, God chose Abraham and said, Abraham, I choose you and your descendants to be the nation that Savior is going to come from. It was all by God's grace. Earlier in Deuteronomy, Moses said to the Israelites, the Lord your God has have chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Israelites were God's treasured possession completely by God's grace. So now as Moses finishes this long sermon to them with all these decrees and laws, here's how he finished. He says, the Lord commands you this day to follow his decrees and laws. He said, in complete obedience, follow them with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You have declared today that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, that you will listen to his voice. And as God's special people, as the people of God, what were the Israelites to do? They were to keep his commands. That's what God was asking him to do. He was asking them to to keep his commands. You know, if you're the the people of God, it means you don't get to live however you want to live. It means you don't do... Whatever you want to do, it means that you live for God. It it means that you want to do what God wants you to do. And 
as God's treasured possession, the Israelites were going to keep his commands. And I hope you realize that wasn't just true for them. This is true for Christians today too. There's a simple verse in the New Testament that I go back to a lot. It's 1 John 5 verse 3. It says, this is love for God. Do you know how it finishes? This is love for God to keep his commands. I was talking with a friend this week who has a, a new employee at his church. And this new employee has a great attitude. And so he asked my friend, the pastor, he said, what can I do to, to, to do the best job I can for you? And do you know what my friend told him? Do what I tell you to do. <laughs> kind of makes sense, right? If this employee is going to do the very best job to help out the pastor the most, what should he do? He should do what the pastor tells him to do, right? It works the same with God. If we want to live for God, it's not complicated. What should we do? Keep his commands. This is love for God, to keep his commands. Why? You know that motivation is such a big thing in our world and in our hearts. Why would the Israelites want to keep God's commands? Well, you have to hear what God says to them. Second half of our lesson says this. It says, the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised. And that you are to keep his commands. He has decreed that he will set you up with praise and fame and honor above all the other nations he has made and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. And what was the Israelites' motivation? It was this. God had made them his treasured possession. Often people think like this. They think, if, if I obey God, then God will love me. Is that how it works? The Bible says it's the complete opposite. Because God loves me, I want to obey God. Out of all the peoples on earth, God had chosen those Israelites to be his treasured possession. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful thing? And the Israelites, they were motivated by God's grace to them to keep his commands. God chose them. They were going to obey him. Sounds like a good arrangement, doesn't it? So how did it turn out? Did the Israelites actually keep God's commands? No. Did they end up loving the Lord with their heart and with all of their soul? No. And we, we can just go over some of those commands we talked about. Did the Israelites worship the Lord and the Lord alone? No. Not always. Did they always use honest weights and measures in their business dealings? No. Not always. Did the husbands always treat their wives with respect and faithfulness? No. Did they always show compassion to foreigners and widows and the fatherless? No, they didn't. They, they broke God's commands over and over again. God had made this great agreement with them and they broke God's agreements. And we today like to think, well, why in the world would they do that? And of course, we know the answer because we've done the same thing. The fact that you're here today, I think it means you say, God, we love you, right? Well, fill in this sentence. This is love for God to obey his commands. Do you do that? Do I do that? It seems to me that Christians today are really concerned about forcing non-Christians to follow the Ten Commandments. It seems like this is really on Christians' minds, getting other people to follow the Ten Commandments. Do you know where Christians should start? We should start by actually knowing what the Ten Commandments are. And then maybe we should start by, by following them ourselves. Have we? You shall have no other gods. You always love the Lord above everything else. I think we're guilty. Shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Do you ever just throw out there, oh my God, a sin. Guilty. Honor your father and mother. Have you done that? Guilty. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lying. Guilty, 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 guilty. You shall not covet. 
guilty. We, we've broken God's commands too, haven't we? And so here were God's special people, his chosen people, and they had broken their agreement, their covenant with God. And so what would God do? And just imagine this. If you made an agreement with someone and every single day that person broke their side of the agreement, what would you do? You'd stop the agreement, right? Say, I'm done with this. That's what God should have done. But he didn't. There's a verse in the New Testament that says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13. Isn't that amazing to think about? If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And when God's people broke their covenant, when they broke their agreement with God, do you know what God did? He still kept his promise. He sent Jesus into the world. And what group of people was Jesus born from? The Israelites. Just like God had promised. And Jesus took all the sins of the Israelites and all the sins of you and me and all the sins of the whole world onto himself and he died on the cross. You see, when God's people sinned against him, God saved them. When God's people turned away from him, God sought after them and he found them. And if we are faithless, he remains faithful. God never forgot about his treasured possession. Actually, God had even bigger plans. God kept his promise and he sent the Savior Jesus from the Israelites, just like he had promised. But now that Jesus has come, who's God's treasured possession today? I think you know that there's a lot of Christians who say that still today the nation of Israel is God's special people. Have you heard Christians say this? There's Christians who emphasize that this is why the United States or that Christians in general need to provide support for the political nation of Israel because they are God's special people. Is that true? No. Already in Jesus' day, the, the people of Israel rejected Jesus as their Savior. It's a sad thing. Jesus was rejected by his own people. And if you don't have faith in Jesus, is, is there any salvation? If you don't have faith in Jesus, are you the people of God? No, the modern nation of Israel today is, is not God's treasured possession. But the New Testament tells us something amazing. The New Testament takes all of the special phrases that God used for the Israelites long ago and applies them to a totally different group of people. Do you know who the New Testament applies all those promises and all those beautiful things to? To Christians. That's what we heard in our second lesson today. We heard, but you are a chosen people, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Can you hear how the, the New Testament takes all those special phrases that God used for the Israelites long ago and applies them to, to God's people today, to anyone who believes in Jesus, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Who are those words addressed to? All Christians. To you. God takes all those phrases he used for the Israelites long ago and he applies them to Christians today. And in fact, Peter says, once you are not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Just think of what that's saying to you and me. Once we were not the people of God, but now you've been baptized. When you were baptized, you became a part of God's family. Now you are the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, yet Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. The Holy Spirit put faith in Jesus in our hearts. Now, now you have received mercy. God's promises about his special people that were meant for the Israelites in the Old Testament, now they're meant for anyone who, by God's grace, believes in Jesus as their Savior. And do, do you know what that means for you? It means that you are God's treasured possession. So I was thinking of an easy way to remember that. I thought maybe we could say you're God's TP. Except I thought about that a little while and 
Maybe that makes you think about toilet paper. And that's not, that's not what the Bible is telling us today. You're, you're God's treasured possession. You don't have to do something grand for God to love you. He already chose you. Chose you to be his own. Right? You don't have to earn God's favor. The Bible says God has declared you righteous and holy through faith in Jesus as your Savior. The words that Moses spoke to the Israelites 3,500 years ago, they are true for you. The Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, just as he promised. And I pray that the Holy Spirit lead you to actually believe those words. I know that some of you today, you feel alone. You feel like no one in your life has ever chosen you. It's not true. You are God's treasured possession. I know that some of you today, you you feel worn out, used up, old. It doesn't tell the whole story. You are God's treasured possession. I know that some of you today, you feel guilty, sinful, and dirty. It's not the full story. You're God's treasured possession, and Jesus washed away your sins when he died for you on the cross. I know some of you today, you, you feel insignificant, unimportant, like you don't matter. It's not the full story. You are God's treasured possession all by God's grace through faith in Jesus. You need to hear this. So last week as I was driving around town, I I saw a a big fancy truck that had a big bumper sticker on the back that said, professional failure. And as I sat behind him in traffic, I wondered to myself, what does he mean with his bumper sticker that says professional failure? And then I noticed all of the other bumper stickers on the back of his vehicle, and I can't repeat any of them because they were all filled with profanity, and I think I know what he means. He put that sticker, professional failure, on the back of his truck because he feels like a professional failure. And I would say all their other bumper stickers with their profanity, they prove it. He feels like he's never done anything right. No matter what he does, He fails and there comes a point when you say, why even bother trying? You ever feel like that? A professional failure. No matter what you do, it doesn't work out. No matter what you decide, you're going to fail. Maybe that's true. Maybe everything you've done has failed. but, But you know what? That doesn't matter. Because who you are has nothing to do with how successful you've been. Who you are depends on what Jesus has done for you. And Jesus considers you worthy enough to die on the cross. He considers you cool enough to create a place for you in heaven. Professional failure or not, you are God's treasured possession. This is what motivates us as Christians. If you've ever had a great boss at work who appreciates everything that you do, what does that motivate you to do? Work harder. If you've ever had a a great teacher at school who's compassionate and truly cares about you, what does that lead you to do? Study hard. If you have a God as full of grace as our God is, what does that lead us to do? Can you fill in this verse? This is love for God to obey his commands. Carefully observe them with all your heart. And with all your soul, walk in obedience to him. Follow his voice. Do you see how this works? Being God's treasured possession is what motivates us to live our lives for God. And this is really what we've heard this summer in the book of Deuteronomy. It's a constant encouragement for God's people to be fully committed to the Lord. Motivated by God's grace to us. God's people are to be fully committed to the Lord and I think I've shared this with some of you before, but I heard a a great statement once that the person said that the difference between being fully committed to something and just being involved with something is the difference between bacon and eggs. Have you heard this before? 
The difference between being fully committed to something and just being involved with something is the difference between bacon and eggs. You see, with the eggs, the chicken is just involved. But with the bacon, the pig is fully committed. Right? Do you see why? Does this make sense? Right, so the difference between being fully committed and just being involved is the difference between bacon and eggs. And Which was Jesus for us? Now, this sounds like a strange thing to say, but he was 100% the bacon, wasn't he? Jesus was all in. He didn't hold anything back. He even gave his life for you and me. That's what motivates you and me, to live our lives for God. Don't be an eggs Christian. Be a bacon Christian, right? Because you're God's treasured possession. It doesn't get any better than that. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I I traveled behind this truck this week that that said professional failure on the back. And I bet that man, just like many of us, can feel like we're, we're failures, that we don't matter, that nobody cares. In your word, you make clear to us that that is not the case Just like you chose those Israelites long ago to be your treasured possession, the nation your Savior would come from, you tell us Christians today that anyone who believes in Jesus is your treasured possession too. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to, to see your grace to us. And may your grace to us in Jesus be what motivates us to live for you. The book of Deuteronomy is a constant encouragement to God's people in view of your grace to be fully committed to you. Please lead us to live lives fully committed to you. Help us to show our love for you by keeping your commands. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.